Hey everyone! <laughs> Just immediately imitating me, Leon. How's everyone doing? How is everyone doing on this beautiful Sunday? It's time for another round of questions. We got some pretty exciting stuff today. Uh, got some really good questions. And then after that, I also want to... I was thinking that maybe we could look at the team challenges. And sort of look through them together and discuss them. Maybe have like a bit of feedback. Because uh, I think we discussed that last time, right? Last AMA. That that would be like an interesting thing to do. So that would be awesome. Hey Lloyd, hey Cairo, hey Ben. How are we all doing? Good. That's good. It's great to hear, man. Oh, and now the bot starts working? Great. Thanks, bot. Or spam in the channel. Hydrate again. Thanks, Lloyd. <laughs> I don't know if I set a timer on that because I know that you're going to be spamming that one now. <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah, okay. God damn it. Yeah, I didn't put a timer on that one. Okay. I I appreciate you all looking out for me. <laughs> the drinking game. I should have I should have bought like a, a brought like a refill for this one then. Hydration challenge. Give me like water poisoning. All right. All right. I get it. I'm going to make a note of that. Um, Hydrate. Timer. <laughs> awesome. All right. I think we're already 10 minutes in. I started late, so it's time to dive into our first questions. Um, for the first one, I'm gonna I'm gonna open like a bunch of stuff. I'm opening Blender, I'm opening my project in Unreal because it's a question about the second UV workflow. Um to mask to mask like um or to to lay to overlay additional layers on top of your trim sheets, for example. Um, <laughs> just noticed that it has sunglasses. So let me open up some stuff in the background and then we can, uh, can go into it. So the first question is from Ioana. Uh, she asked, I keep hearing you and other artists talk about the second UV workflow to mask large environment pieces. I'm aware of the way that it works on Star Citizen, for example, where they use titleables and normal decals for edge damage and small details, but how do you use a second UV to have a unique mask? Um, so that's that's exactly what we're going to dive into. Hey, Junster5! How is it going? Um, okay, let me... What is the prop that we're going to be talking about? I'll just take one of my cards, for example. Doop. Okay, let me switch screens. While all my stuff is booting up in the background. And then we'll dive straight into it. So, da 
that's all right. I'm just waiting for Unreal Engine to boot up at the moment. I mean, we can dive into it already, right? Um, so I have two models here. They're both the same, but they have different UV setups. I'll dig into it like a bit later. Um, so this is just my normal cart with just like the UVs for the trim sheet. So you can see that I have, um, let's have a look here. You can see that I have like my normal planks and then I use parts of my UVs as cutouts for like these, these bolts and then also these, these damage decals too. So like all the damage that you see on these carts, um, let me bring it up. Do I still have them floating? No. So all the damage that you see on this cart is coming from damage decals that I'm putting on top of it. So this is just a normal trim sheet without any of the additional, additional layers on top of it. So you can see that that damage is coming from a decal that is that is directly on it. It's called mesh decals. So they're actually embedded within that that mesh. Um. <laughs> I'm already out of water. Damn it. So that's it. Um. Anyway, so we have these, this setup with like the damage decals going on top of the trim sheet um, to create like these, these extra bits of details, like these bolts making, making a connection with like these spokes. That's all done through these damage decals. Now where this gets interesting, right? Because now we only have a trim sheet set up. So we don't have any of the unique details that we would, that we would need or that we would like to to make it look good right um so that's where we we need to figure out a way how to add like additional layers on top of it that's where the second uv workflow comes into place so what that means is um we need some sort of way to the reason why we take like a second UV is because we need some sort of way to uniquely add details on top of the mesh that we already have. Because if we look at this UV, for example. Uh, oh, shit. Hold on, give me a sec. And then if we go to our wooden kit, I'll take the normals because it's a little bit clearer, right? So there's a bunch of stuff overlapping on the trim sheet, which is normal, right? Because you want them to like reuse as much as many parts of the trim sheet as possible. But this doesn't give us any space to add additional unique uh, details on top of it. Because then if we add unique damage here or like unique moss, say on this part, then it's going to be projected on all these UV shells that are here. It's like all this stuff is all going to be looking the same. So that's where the second UV comes in. So what I do here is, uh, let's have a look. UV maps. So I have my base UV map. I just duplicate it and then do like a unique map out of it. So this is just like an auto unwrap, nothing fancy. Um, no, it's not even an auto unwrap. It's a packed version of my trim sheets because for my trim sheets I have I've squared off like a lot of the UV islands already so that's basically what we want for the unique map as well and then you can see that this this looks super fucked up at the moment right but that doesn't matter because this is like the second UV um, so if we look here, this is all nice. This is all good. Um, we got everything laid out uniquely here so that if we wanted to add like additional details on like any section of this cart, we can do it really easily now. 
Um, however, this this brings up a, a thing in Substance Painter, right? Because it doesn't allow you to only texture the second UV. And that's where this second card comes into play that I have underneath here. So this is a card that I specifically use to texture in Painter. So it's basically a duplicate from this one. And then what I do here is I remove the trim sheet UV. So if you look here, it only has a unique UV on it. Where this one has the unwrap on it. That also means that if I want to do any adjustments to the UVs, I'll have to do it on this one and then duplicate it again to this one. Because say if I do any adjustments on these UVs, they don't correspond to the UVs that I have on this one, and they need to be matching. So, um, let's have a look, Jacob. Do you auto-generate light maps in Unreal for the cart? Would it not override the second channel? We'll get into that. We'll get to we'll we'll get to that part. Um, so then, what I've done here. So you export you export the painter this this painter card, right? You export this one to substance. And then I have a setup here with four unique channels for the different the different channels that I'm going to be packing in like one texture. So I have red, green, blue and alpha. And any channel here is going to use a black and white mask. And then I can preview them with like a, a single channel preview here if I wanted to. Um, and the way that I've set it up right now, for most of the items that I'm gonna be, that, I'm, that I have in this scene, I'll be working with a dirt in the first channel, so the red channel. Then I'll be doing like a moss in the green channel. I'll have like a color variation in the blue channel and then like a water damage layer in like the alpha channel um let's see uh is there anything else that i want to did you ever test out how low you can go with the textile density with the mask um i experimented a little bit with it but I need to do some further experimentation once I have like a couple of very varied props because that's actually a good point that you bring up, right? Um, normally, what you would do is you have these masks at like a lower resolution because they don't need that much resolution to to like work with, right? Um, you can get away with with some of these edges looking like fairly blurry. Um. So that's a good point. I'll still, I'll still need to do some investigation with how low I can actually go. Um, I think... Let's have a quick look. What do I have them as now? This also brings me to my next section too. That once you have... Uh, once you have like one of these masks, right? This is how it's going to look. So, like we have the red, which is like the dirt. Then we have green, which is my moss, my moss layer. We have blue for the color variation. And then we have the alpha for water damage or like water on top of it. So, I mean, this opens up like a whole bunch of options. This opens up like a, a bunch of options that you can just like, uh, you can blend this with, with vertex paint on top of it, where you have like additional control. Um, you can play around with the color variation mask that I'm using, for example. So, a good example is this card. I wanted to figure out a way where this wood looks different from the wood on top of it. So, I just used the color variation mask for that. So... Let's have a look how it looks without any of these layers on top of it. This is just a trim sheet, right? And then if 
I go back into selection and I go into the blue channel, which is my color variation channel. This is what that adds. Like that's the difference that you can bring with that. And then I've built in some additional control that if I go into this material instance here, which has like a whole bunch of parameters that I can play around with the strength of like the, the color variation. I can even change like the, the color of it if I want to change it up a little bit. So there's like a bunch of control that you can just build in if you wanted to. I can desaturate like the main color if I wanted to play around with that. Um, I can also control like if I if I wanted to if I wanted to be wet like on an on a material instance basis, right? Um, and then I have like the control for the green channel, which is the moss channel, and then also the red channel, which is the dirt channel in this case. They don't have to be moss or dirt. And that's the cool thing about this system. I can I can swap out the texture maps and I can just overlay another material. So now this is all focused on wood, right? Um, so now this is all focused on wood, but say I'm doing like a metal prop and I have like a large metal surface for, for a spaceship, for example. I can just swap out the the first layer, like the red channel. I can plug in like a bunch of rust textures, and then I can use the same sort of system to have metal with like a rust with like a rust layer on top of it. And then I could even use the green channel for for like a paint channel or something. So this is like a really versatile system, and you could even expand on it. Um, where you have four layers on top of it, right? Because now I'm working with two swappable texture layers, which is my dirt and my moss. But then if you look at the color variation channel, it is just a color that I lay on top of it. So it doesn't actually use any texture inputs. Same for the water channel. It doesn't use any texture inputs, except for the mask, of course. I could even build a system where I have four of those layers that, that I can layer on top of it. So you can have like a metal a metal spaceship but that has rust, damage, uh, paint, and then something else on top of it, right? All driven by textures. It's going to be more expensive shader, but it's definitely doable. And they all use like the same kind of system here. Um... So let's have a look, right? Yeah, so we have all these different these different um, masks set up right now. And then we take them into this format, right? That I was explaining before. So again, red is for the dirt, green is for moss, blue is for color variation, alpha is for water. And now I can I can apply this to this this prop if I select like all the layers fill it and then I've built in some additional control where I could even go in with vertex paint and say like oh my god these these wheels are too are too muddy I can just start painting out some of that stuff and have like my manual control built on top of that or like have specific sections that are dirtier than other stuff. So the initial result is driven by, by a mask because you don't want to be doing like bespoke adjustments to like every prop in your scene that, especially if you're thinking about scale, right? That will just take too much time. But it is good if you want to have something stand out in your scene, like a hero section. You can just go in and paint out some sections. Which also means that if we built in this additional control, I can just have a clean version that has no dirt, but still has like all the moss and like all the color variation and the water on it. So, I mean, this system is so versatile the way that it's set up. I can only have moss and water, for example. 
Uh, I don't, I don't think I have moss ticked on. Oh, the wetness ticked on. Yeah, there we go. From that angle, you can see it better. And if I don't want it, I can just, uh, oh, wait. Whoop. I can just fill it to get rid of it. So I have like a lot of control built in here. Which is pretty sweet. So I'm basically using the same technique for all the props that you see here. You see, like without it, it would just look like a, a trim sheet. But if you start adding like all these details on top of it, it can give you like a really, really nice result. So just fill it. That's just a trim sheet. And then we have like all the layers on top of it. Which makes like a huge difference. And then I can I can still go back and like tweak some of these masks. I can start painting like unique sections on this if I wanted to. Most of this is driven by generators at this point. I do I do add some unique stuff to it. Um, but the base is always driven by generators, so I can have like a quick result in the engine. And that gives me an end result like this. And I, I'm i probably going to use that on, on a lot of the stuff that you see here. I've already started porting it to uh, these sections, for example, too. They use the same kind of system. Where, if we look at it this way. This is where I need to be careful with the masking, right? Uh, this is an interesting sort of issue that I have currently where these these damage decals, which are mesh decals, they, they create ambient occlusion and I'm using ambient occlusion to generate these masks. So you can see it here, for example. That's where I need to go in and like paint out some of that stuff because these this decal has opacity around it so you see really clearly if there's stuff underneath it so like this moss is purely there because it gets generated by ambient occlusion so that's something that needs that needs like a little bit of tweaking <clears throat> you could you could set up a system where you don't really use the ambient occlusion right um but i want to i want to do it the other way around where i use generators first and then start painting out stuff that i don't need does that all make sense Ioana? do you have any questions feel free to just drop them in the chat about this system and i'll explain more about it <laughs> yes you're welcome Yeah, this is, I mean, this is such a, an interesting system. This is also the first time where I've set it up myself. Uh, but you can, I mean, with all the controls that I've built in, you can just, I have, I have controls over like the, the moss color. I have controls over like the color from, for the dirt. I have controls over the color variation, how I want that to look. So let's say if I want to have like, pink planks or something you can just whoop, put that in there so versatile just a good system um let's have a look right uh oh yeah jacob that's a good point um let's go back to it because you mentioned you mentioned that um let's have a look because it auto on Unreal Engine 4 automatically generates light maps for you based on the first UV set, right? So this is an important setting. I use the source light map index, the first one, and then I make like a new destination light map on the second one. So keep in mind that this starts at zero, right? So zero is my trim sheet. One is my unique one. And then two is my light map. So I have three UV 
uh, mass in the end once I import it to Unreal. Because you're gonna see if I put it back to the standard settings, right? Uh, oh, that's not my intention. Let's move it back. You have to re import it as well to make this show up. Oh no. So you can. What's it doing? Go away. You can see that this is totally fucked up right now. Like it, the uh, the textures don't make sense, um, and like the the unwrapping is in is in like the UVs are basically fucked up at this point. So that's why I have like uh, well three UVs at the end basically. So UV zero is my trim sheet. UV one is my unique, and UV two is my light map UV. And I'll have to do that for every asset that uses this kind of shader. Um, let's have a look. Oh, I think... Man. Let me just re-export this. Because now I tried to re-import it, but it couldn't find a file because it was an empty FPX. That's something that I'll have to sort out with my exporter. So. Okay, let's re-import this one. Let's drag that back in. Cool. Alright, let's uh, fix this one up too. So we'll have to go in to the light maps save it out oh you don't even need to re-import it cool done so that's the whole technique and i mean like i said a thousand times before right in this uh in this ama it's so versatile you can you can play around with the color variation mask and even even use it if you just want to completely recolor like a section of wood like this one so it's so cool all right uh let's have a look in the chat right if there's any more questions about this in the challenge we were using less than uh, one fourth textile density for the mask and it seemed fine because the titleables were full rest i'm not too sure um yeah oh that's that's actually something that i wanted to look at right uh let's have a look at the size of the mask that i'm currently using Doo -doo -doo -doo. so let's start with the wood kit what is this this is like a 2k so my trim sheet is 2k and i think if i'm correct like the mask for this one is 1k yeah but I could probably go lower. I think 512 still still holds up. So I could probably use like something like that. So the trim sheet would be 2K and then the mask for an object like this size would be like 512. Uh, let's have a look. Same Cairo. I think you can get away with a lot when it just crunches in broader details. Yep, exactly. Exactly. It's all about optimization. Trying to get the... The most out of the textures that you import. Mind-blowing is the right word for it. I want to use this in my corridor. Yeah, like sometimes you don't even need a system like this, right? Um, if I'm thinking uh, about your corridor, it, you could get away with just using decals as a setup too where you just uh when i'm when i say decals i don't mean mesh decals but like deferred decals like you would just set them up and like project them onto onto the faces that you need that's probably all you would need for a corridor like that because you also want it to be pretty clean right writing this down 
All right, cool. This was a really good question, Joanna. I appreciate it. Um, Jacob, are you using Substance Designer for your titles or Sculpting and Substance Painter or a mixture of both? Uh, it's a mixture of like everything, basically. Um, for the trim sheet, I'm using Sculpting and Substance Painter. For the ground titles, I'm using Substance Designer. Um, for the potatoes, I'm using... Like for those title balls, for example, I'm using simulations and then baking that down and then texturing it in Substance Painter. It depends on the thing that I'm working on currently. So yeah. Uh, let's have a look. Let's switch back to the other one. Roop. Sexy potatoes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay cool um i think that's it right how do you yep okay cool next question then is from uh, cairo you said recently that you don't do many props or other smaller things as your role of a level artist position do you miss doing the things that that you would do in personal work but not at work and if so do you ever feel uncomfortable not having control over over that to make sure it's up to your own standards um no i think i think that's why i love personal work because that's where i have control i think you just have to realize that at work you don't have control over over what you're going to be doing um well to a certain degree right because if you're if you're a hard surface artist they're not going to throw like organic stuff at you that would be just illogical uh, unless they want to test you or if the project really needs it right um but yeah you just have to realize that if we if we're talking about work then work will always be work right it it will they will always try to sort of match you with with the stuff that you want to do but there's always going to be you're always going to have to give away some degree of control um and that's why personal work is so important like i love having like you said, I love having that control about, oh, I would I really want to do this and I can just do it. And that's why I keep up personal work. It's probably, yeah, it's probably really healthy to at least have like a project on the side where you can, it doesn't have to be a portfolio project. It doesn't have to be anything like that. It just has to serve as your, your true creative output. Like you're gonna have creative output at work but there might also be periods where you're doing i don't know um you're doing something that you don't want to do like there's always going to be a phase in a project where you have to uh clean bugs and you have to go through the stuff that you did and like clean it up and like make it properly run and yeah documentation is also a good example ben um it's crucial, like it needs to happen. But I mean, for an artist, it's not fun. Um, do you ever feel uncomfortable not having any control over that to make sure it's up to your own standards? Yep, 100%. Um, saying that, saying all the stuff that I, that I said before, right? I definitely do get uncomfortable with not having that control. And there are moments where I get frustrated from like a from like an artistic point of view right because i know that i for example i want to put more time into this i think we discussed this in, in the last episode where there there are certain certain parts of yeah like maybe right before a deadline like for example i'm thinking back to to some of the deadlines that uh, we had a planet coaster there was some stuff that I was doing for like a DLC, for example, where I personally would have loved to spend like an extra week, but it's just, it's just not possible. You, yeah, because deadlines are deadlines. Like I did the best that I could. If I, if I wasn't on the time or if I wasn't on the clock, I would probably have worked on it for like a, another week or something, but it just wasn't, it wasn't possible. And also, if you take a step back and you look at the bigger picture 
and you're really honest and objective about it, that week would have just been a wasted time unless you're talking about like pure artist insight. Because it, it's not going to affect... That's It's not going to affect um, the people playing your game. Like the people that play your game, they see... They see they see the assets, like the breadth of assets that you produce, and they're like, oh my god, this is so cool, this is awesome, I can play with this, and they start playing with ideas in their head, if we're talking about Planet Coaster, right? Which was so community-driven, and it was, we were basically making the Lego pieces that then people could use in their own levels. Um, and that's all they cared about. They didn't care about maybe some seam was misaligned or if you put like two two textures together that they wouldn't like 100% correctly tile or that the the tops of bricks wouldn't 100% correctly align with like the sides of things they don't care because they're going to they're going to be putting roofs and they're going to be putting additional building pieces on it anyway so that they don't see it so there's always a difference between what you want to achieve as an artist uh, compared to what is actually needed for the project or what what the bigger picture needs. Because that's the thing you need to keep in mind. You're down in the ditches, right? You're the front line when it comes to comes to art. You're so blinded by the stuff that's happening around you, like all the other stuff that's happening and how, how the bigger picture is coming together that you don't know all the all the factors or like you don't know all the all the things that are going to be hooking into the stuff that you do <clears throat> ryan damn that would be hard for me to get used to um what part of it ryan just letting go of the control is that what you what you were on about because it is it is definitely hard yeah letting go yeah but that's that's also the thing right you that's where you put in the balance of like i have my work what i need to when i need to let go um this again it's not 100 percent, right because you still have you still have artistic say in what you want to do there's, there's still a lot of moments where you can say like, look, I really want to push this. And oftentimes because they trust you, right? Because you're the artist working on it. That's why they hired you for this position. They will, they will gladly help you with that. But there needs to be like a limit to that too. Because you're, you're working in like a bigger, a bigger environment, right? It's not only focused on the art. There's also the other things that are plugging into it. So... It's, it's not 100% letting go because I think you need to be somewhat invested in it too. Where you're just like, okay, I want to make this the best thing possible and really push it towards that. Um, but you just have to be honest in that there there's a limit to that too. Oh, hey, Lloyd. Thanks for the resub, man. I, I think I missed it like 25 minutes ago. But yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Cairo. I appreciate it. Um, let's have a look here. Doo -doo -doo. The next question is from Jacob. Going into an environment... Uh, into an environment? God, going into an interview for the first position... What are some of the questions I should be prepared for that I might not see coming? And what are some of the common questions that would be asked? Um, so this is an interesting one because I did, well, I'm currently doing like an article on that. I've been doing it for like a couple of months, but it just keeps shoved into like the, the back burner, basically. I just need to finish it. Um, let me just open it up. I have like a list in there too. I've been sharing it to to like some of the people inside the community to just help them out with like the interview process. Um So let's have a look in here, right? Do do do. 
Um, so let, let's start out with, with making a a separation between like personal questions, where it's more like HR related, and artistic questions, right? Or like your portfolio. So let's start with the portfolio questions first. Um, most of the time, what you will be doing and what I've experienced the most is that you'll be talking about uh, a project that you worked on. And if you, uh, you'll be talking them through like the, the whole workflow, right? Like the whole process of the thing. They might just uh, bump in with like additional questions and say like, okay, that's cool. How, how do you think, or like, what do you think you could have done there? to like improve the performance, so to say. For example, um, I still remember one of the first interviews that I did, or one of the first, where they were talking about foliage and they asked me if I, I was explaining how I created foliage and they asked me if I knew what alpha or quad overdraw was. Um, and at that point, I just, I just didn't know. I still remember this vividly. Um, I just didn't know what that was. Um, but the... Um, what was I going to say? So I didn't know what that was, right? But I mean, now I do. Like some some sort of questions like that where it's just like testing testing your absolute knowledge about, about one topic. Um, for example, if you're baking high to low... Um, they might they might ask the question where it's like oh you have these balls like how do you prevent them from like being skewed like how do you approach that and then you might answer like oh i use marmoset for baking where i can use skew painting to get rid of all that stuff or if you use like a more traditional way where you bake two normal maps and you can recombine them into one which is like the old school way of doing it right um as long as you know what you're talking about um I think that is the most common thing you will uh, you will hear during when you're talking about your portfolio. Um, it's how how did you approach like this specific part of the project, or like how did you approach like um, this section here? Uh, why why did you decide to spend less time on this part but then more time on this? Um, or also, if we're talking about portfolio, you might be showing off pieces that you've not shown or like are not publicly available and then talking about why why that is why uh, why they're not publicly available or why you decided to remove them from your portfolio too if you want to go that far um so yeah i mean there's a whole bunch of questions that i can name up um look you know what i'm just gonna share it here uh it is it is still work in progress so keep that in mind um where's the chat Doo -doo -doo. so have a look at that one jacob there's like a bunch of questions in there there's i mean it's a really elaborate interview interview process for the games industry like a really elaborate article and i'm probably gonna be spending a little bit more time in the coming weeks to just clean some of that up and then just uh, finally post them. My friend recently got hired at high res and he said that he got asked a ton of technical questions he didn't really know the, the answer for. It kind of spooked me. I wish there was something, something out there that covered technical questions because you don't know what you don't know. Well, the thing is, it's not a bad thing if you don't know technical questions. Because it's not it's not a quiz, right? It kind of is, but it, the the way that I want to say it is that if you don't know something, that's totally fine. You got to be open about that too, because else it just it just becomes like a questionnaire type of thing, right? Where you're just learning all the technical questions by hand, and then hoping that they that they're gonna ask those questions. What they're basically trying to do with those questions is see how deep your experience with with that subject is but if you don't have that deep of a knowledge of it it's also not a big deal 
um, for example, the foliage question that I brought up is something that if you care about the optimization part of things, which you need to do as an environment artist, you kind of need to have an answer to that. Because if we're talking about like the alpha overdraw when it comes to foliage, that's a pretty basic example of like a technical question. That's nothing niche or like nothing super specific. It's something that's out there in the open. Like if you're doing foliage for um, for games, that's the thing you need to be known. Like uh, that's the thing you need to know about because that's the major impact of performance in games. Jacob, thanks. It's my first one, so I'm nervous, but this will help. Yeah, man, I... It's one of those things where, I mean, first of all, good luck. You got this. And then second of all, you're going to get better at this the more you do them. My my first one was an absolute disaster. But hey, I still got the job. So if that gives you any consolation. <laughs> hey, Ryan, thanks for the resub, man. Appreciate it. Um... So yeah, I hope that this that this um, article helps, Jacob. It's a pretty long one, pretty extensive. Okay, next question from Lloyd James. So when you are negotiating pay, do you think you should purposely go higher and then come back down? Yeah, I think this applies for like any negotiation that you're doing. You're um you're pushing you're pushing the the limits a little bit, right? Um, however, you got to be careful that you don't push too high because then they might be like, hmm, okay, I don't think we can even go there even if you wanted to. So that's why uh, some people propose to negotiate with brackets in mind or like with, um, what do they call it? Yeah, brackets. So you have, you have like your highest point but then you know what you can, what your kind of lowest point is, and just figure out some stuff in between, um, so that you give them some leeway. So what that could be, like say for example, just as a simple numbers example, right? Um, the lowest you can go is twenty k a year, and then what you want your bracket to be could be something like uh, twenty two to twenty four or something like that, right? So you have your bracket higher than your actual lowest number so that they know that, oh, he's open to negotiation, but that your lowest point is 22. That you're projecting outwards, right? But then if, say, say if they push back and they're like, I don't know, man, the best we could do to get as close to your brackets as possible is probably like 21 and a half or something. Then you're still like gaining one and a half on top of your lowest point. It's a tricky subject. I've, I gotta be honest, like I've never negotiated myself because I was always fairly happy with the, with the outcome of it. Maybe that's gonna, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with the, with the salaries that I've, that I've been offered always. So there was never, never like really a thing where I had to negotiate for it. But it's a good question, though, because I think definitely in some cases you have to negotiate. Or just get back to them and say, like, look, this is this is my my bracket that I'm talking about. So, Lloyd, thanks for the question, man. And then we got the last one before we dive into uh, some of the some of the chat here. Um, another one from Iwana. So, if I found two open positions at the same company, one associate and one senior, but I felt my skill level is somewhere in the middle, which one should I apply for? Uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Oh man, that's a tricky one. Because I, I would want to say apply for the senior one and then mention somewhere that you think that you're working your way to senior and you're somewhere in the middle of the two right so you're working your way up to senior but you don't think you're but you feel like your skill level is is not senior yet because 
this may be like a perception thing, right? Um, the two things that I'm thinking about now is that they know that you want to aim higher than shoot yourself in the foot, which can be a good perception. Um, like a, a good perception thing where it's like, mm, okay, like she knows what she wants, right? That that kind of thing where where you always you already have a vision built into that statement where if you if you say like oh i'm applying for associate but i'm actually higher than an associate you're kind of i feel like you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot already this might be my perception though um but what might be valid is that there's going to be less applicants for the senior position than for the associate position so your chances to be seen might be higher in that one that's what i'm thinking at least it's a it's an interesting question because if they don't have an open position for that they're probably not looking for someone like that right with that skill level um it doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply i think you should always apply because they might be thinking about maybe getting someone on or they might not have people people with the right skill set applying for a senior or associate position so then to uh what is it to like to like pat the team a little bit instead of waiting for like an associate or a senior to come in they might have like an intermediate come in at that point so i would definitely still send a message it's a yeah it's a good one it's a good question that's what i think about it though so take it with a grain of salt um yeah no worries anytime you got some good questions good questions today all right let's see what's happening in the chat let's see if we missed something i think we covered everything about the second uv channel right mm. What's the office side of the games industry like? What do you mean? Like just uh, the teams and like the atmosphere? Because it's pretty awesome. Open offices. Well, at least the office that I worked in, like open offices. Everyone's really communicative, helpful. Um, I mean, most of us are just like a bunch of nerds together in, in an office, right? It's getting together because we love the creation of games. So, uh... It's really nice. That's probably the, the thing that I miss about uh, not not being able to go into the office right now, right? Is just like the the camaraderie and like the people that you're surrounded by, and yeah, you can really feel the passion in in like an office. Nerd. Thanks, Martin. Appreciate the backup, man. Oh, for um. For context, like we work together, right? So he's a fellow nerd. <laughs> Let's have a look here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I've told my employer if they can uh, give me 75k, I'll retire from the company. Doo -doo -doo -doo. I think that was it for for the chat questions too. So, what I want to do is I want to have a look at these beautiful challenge results from like both teams. But before we do that, I'll need to refill my water. So I'll be right back. All right, we're back. Hydrate, hell yeah.
Thanks, Lloyd. Appreciate you looking out for me, buddy. Oh, look at this beautiful environment. I honestly... I honestly was really surprised by uh, by the result of this challenge. Like, they, they really... Like, I've been talking to Lloyd about it too, right? Like, they really blew, blew us out of the water, which is like the end result. So good. I love the lighting in here. Especially because we've kind of seen it coming together in like the last couple of ye uh, days, right? Just the tweaks, the little tweaks to the lighting and to really offset the, the orange. The orange with like the purples and the blues. Like, oh man. So good. It's so good. And then like all the details. Just like smart reuse, right? Smart use of like all the props, like all the assets here. Like look at this. Have like a book bookcase and then have books like prop up like a second bookcase. Really cool stuff that's happening here. We have like the nice little telescope with like the nice lighting hitting it. Like little post-its hanging on it. It's so good. I love all the all the little details. Like this has only been done in a month. That is crazy. This is crazy. Blew me away too. There was so much work to be done and they really nailed it. Yeah, exactly. Like that that counts for both teams, right? We'll jump to like the, the other team next. Um, man, they were so good. Uh, I hope I have the latest for this. I think so. Yeah, and I think how, how everything came together, because this is the, the biggest worry that I had with a stylized team and having it for the first time. Um, Oh yeah, that's also a good thing to bring up, right? This was the first time that we actually had a stylized team taking part of the challenge too. So my fear was that the the stylized the the stylized assets were so um what is it like divergent in style that they wouldn't come together and match really well at the end. But man, was I ever proven wrong? This looks really good. Really good. Yeah, exactly. They wouldn't match in visual style, but you look at all this stuff coming together, like it's really, really amazingly done. There's obviously, well, obviously, there's like some details, right? Oh, is that a floating book? <laughs> there's some, some details that I would, if I had like another, another period of time, right? To work on it. And that this wasn't this wasn't done in like a month, then I would say I'm I'm missing some color variation in the tiles. Like it needs to be subtle, right? Because it takes up a lot of space. Um, some decals, like some of the edges where you have like some dust on the ground. Um, you have maybe some some like stylized dripping from like some of the walls or something something to to embed some of these pillars within the walls obviously stuff that i'm talking about here is details right so this is not taking away all the great work that the teams have done because this looks good looks really good all right let's jump into the next team Well, wait, actually, what do you all think about this? Like, if you're, if you're looking at this environment, let's hear it for, for team one. I'm really curious about what you all think about this. Because I assume that most of you have seen these challenges already, right? Cheer! Oh, personally.
Yeah, I I agree. This was uh because it, it wasn't without these issues, right? Like um there, there there was there were like a couple of hiccups, but damn the end result speaks for itself. So really nice job. Worth it. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. I'm honestly surprised how well it came out. When they showed it, I thought it was going to be near impossible to complete. Yeah, exactly. I think <laughs> I think um, me and Lloyd actually talked about it when we were like, oh my god, are they going to make it? Like, what, what do we want to do? We had some discussions um, about maybe we need to extend it, right? Or what do we want to do with the timeline? But I'm glad we didn't. I mean, it was a little bit stressful at the end, right? So... But it was, again, like uh, Iwana said, so worth it. Came together so well. Um, Jacob, Mr. Feedback. Well, yeah, the feedback was pretty simple. I was basically talking about like some of the details, like having some some decals, having some dirt around some of the edges. Um, it's really minor stuff, really. Um, Because, yeah, like, all this stuff came together really nice. Again, just smart use of, like, the assets that were available, right? Like, all the books, you know, if you look at it, they're all sort of the same books, right? But they're scaled and rotated and, like, pushed in, in positions that they don't really feel like they're the same books. It's really nice. Really good use of modularity. I love it. I love it. I love it, but I'm a, fi a stylized fanboy. Hell yeah! Came out gorgeous and they should all be proud of themselves. Hell yeah. That's what I'm talking about, Ryan. Did awesome. Oh, this shoulder, this shoulder is also gorgeous. Having like the nice framing. Great job, Team One. I think only Iwana is here, right? So Iwana has has the the duty to spread the word of us cheering for them. All right, let's dive into this one. Oh yeah, Jacob, that's right. Oh sorry, Jacob. <laughs> Floating candles are such a good way to, to fill light where you need it. Yeah, right? Let's go back to it. That's actually a good point. That's actually a good point because they do bring that really nice contrast in the scene, right? Yeah, that's a really good point, man. Um, what did Jacob say? Um, I missed the feedback. I don't think my trim sheet fit. What do you mean your trim sheet fit in terms of style? Because I think it gets away with it. Like you have some of some of that stylized edging edging to it. Uh, because if you look at the bricks on, on the wall, right? Like the stones on the wall. It kind of has that same sort of texturing style to it. So I think it does fit, man. Obviously, if you're going to look up close and maybe without the lighting influencing it, the discrepancy is probably going to be brought out a little bit more. But, but I feel like it came out like a bad realism attempt. No, man. It came out nice. It's, look, it's the lighting doing this job too, right? Like the lighting is really pulling everything together. And it's really massaging, massaging like everything together. Where if this was, um, if this was like lit with like, well, unlit or something like that. You would probably see the discrepancies a little bit more. But I think it came out great, man. It came out great. And it's also nice that you have these gold trims here. Which kind of match... Well, which just match with like the, the whole astrology theme. And it also brings out that this is like the, the focal point of the, of the scene a bit more. Because it's like nicely decorated. It has like nice trims on it. Looks good. 
looks good. All right. Let's go to this one. Whoop. Hell ye. Okay, I need to... Um, how, how should I preface this? Like, it was really fun seeing the team work on this. Like, especially because we, we have the option to peek into their channels, right? To just uh, keep a little eye out. But uh, it was so fun at the end seeing seeing the team just play around with stuff and, like, trying stuff out. And, um, I mean, even even the video, right? It has, it has, like, a torch in it. And then you have, like, this fucking weird monster at the end, too. Which is, like, a pig with, like, a really long neck. And... <laughs> I think didn't we talk about it, Lloyd? Where where we were like, what the hell is happening? Like we we weren't sure like what was gonna be implemented, but everyone was having such a such a great time in that that like final week. It was just so fun to to watch it. Yeah, it's scary, right? I think really nailed really nailed the atmosphere in this one. Really did a good job. Let's have a look here and then like some some fluid simulations and we have like lots of lots of candles you have the bats up here too which look awesome kind of bring back that scale right you have the stairs and the skulls are probably the thing that brings scale to this but then the bats do like an awesome job at that too you want to see the pig monster um Oh, let's have a look. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, we we have some stuff in movement too from like Team One. It's kind of a wait, wait, wait. Let's bring those up as well. I know that we're kind of going back and forth, but. Oh, just look at this. Like, everything's moving. You have the little birds. Um, go away. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for. Let's go to the video. Let's uh, silence this a bit, though. We're kind of going back and forth, right? But... I mean, it's definitely worth showing off, like, these videos. Oh, just look at this. Like, all the movement adds so much to a scene. Yeah, look at all the floating parts. Looks so good. Apologize for the pig demon. <laughs> Cute little chair. Oh, it might have been awesome if there was like something coming out of this, right? It kind of feels like it's kind of missing that. I don't know what would you call it, like holographic or like maybe like a a ray, like a god ray coming out of this or something. Like a pig demon coming out. <laughs> Yeah, came out great. Wait, it has a cat, straight up winner. Yeah, exactly. Look at the little kitty cat. I have all the details in the textures on the floor too. Just came out really great. Oh, I've never seen these bottles up close either. looking awesome i like the little the little dents in it like the little sculpting details got a love potion rum question mark <laughs> these little pictures they do so much too where it, where it really gives you like a feeling that is just like oh my god i need to i need to 
put my thoughts somewhere here and just post it on like a wall or something. This came out great. That's awesome. That is awesome. All right. What do you want from me? Thanks for the follow. Um, all right, let's let's see if we can find like the, the video for the other team, right? Let's start off with that one then. I think you posted it on your your art station, right, Cairo? Is that it? Let me go to that one then. Cairo good brand. I haven't seen the video. Yeah, let's see if we can find it. The full video on here? Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, okay. Yeah. Let's have a look at this video. Yeah, see, they got a torch and everything. You guys went crazy. But that's what these challenges are all about, right? It's all about having fun, like pitching ideas and then trying out stuff and just going crazy. Oh man, those walls look so good. Like all the detail. I remember that you were worried about that, right, Ryan? Where you were just thinking about that the walls weren't go gonna do it justice, but damn, dude, they add so much. <laughs> A little piggy at the end. Yeah, it does, right? It does give me like a Diablo vibe. Yeah, okay, let's... Where's the, where's the piggy? I mean, where did this come from? We saw that in the chat and we were just like, what? What's happening here? <laughs> it's so weird, right? Yeah, this was this was really good. It does have a Diablo vibe, right? The lighting in, in this one is really good as well. Just like the the nice color contrast with the blue and orange. It's really nice. All the candles doing doing a lot of work here. Again, giving you a lot of scale to the scene, right? Yeah, like even even like all the all the small little potions, all the all little trinkets on the side, which you which you barely see, right? In most of these shots, like you go by them so quickly, but if you stop and have a take a look, then it's definitely nice. See ya, Ben! The pig is amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They had like an automatic scattering for, for these props, right? That was pretty cool as well. Like the nice, the nice marble and skull here with the blood coming out of it let's have a look yeah but this shot it looks so good it looks so good i think yeah really great job on the lighting too um Yeah, that's the one thing I wonder. Maybe these are probably to scale, right? These candles and like all these trinkets. But it would have been nice to to put them under like a bigger light or like emphasize them a little bit more. That would have been uh would have been interesting because there's there's like a lot of detail in this that you barely see. Unless you go to like a shot like this, right? And all this stuff also looks really good. Because I think if you 
And if you probably down, downscale like this, this stone slab on the right, it might have helped with like the the items on it not getting lost. And maybe helping, like what would definitely help is just scaling them up a little bit too. Depends on how these are compared to your uh, real world, world size, right? Cave vibes from the forest. Yeah. Yeah, these sculpts, these things, and like you have some of these inscriptions on the walls too. They're sort of look, if we're if we're diving into the nitty-gritty, right? Um I mean again, same for team one, right? This is amazing for what you guys pulled off in like one month. It's fucking crazy. If we dive into the nitty-gritty, then this this sort of uh sculpting detail like sort of clashes with this sort of sculpting detail right because this kind of feels alien to me like these pillars and then you have like historical traditional stuff here it sort of doesn't have like the same language but again again i want to keep saying this right it's fucking crazy that you guys did this in the month really awesome job That's awesome. Lots of candles. And then also these piles. I was, I was, uh, there was one zoomed in shot from Ryan when he was working on this, which was, uh, yeah, exactly. It wouldn't look out of place in AC, exactly. Where, um, going back to this, like, it would be nice to have more separate skulls. And I think Ryan was talking about that. But, I mean, again, time constraints, right? And then if you had, like, piles of, like, more separated skulls and, like, bones, you could probably scatter them on, like, some places. But you could maybe even have used them on, like, the beginning of the staircase. Or in, like, some of the nooks and crannies of the staircase. To just add that little bit of... Of darkness to it. Um... And then also you bridge the gap between this this solid pile and then the what is it, like the floor planes underneath it, right? So that you get some of that separation. Or like that transition is easier. Yeah, but this is awesome. I think this is the benchmark for for the challenges going forward for sure. Uh so we'll have to see. I'm really curious about the next ones now. I mean, this, this, the stuff that came out of this, this challenge, like the two environments that we've seen are, are crazy, are crazy. And I also, just from, from my perspective, right? I just have to thank all of you for making such crazy environments and like really, really, um, helping, helping us promote these challenges too, right? Uh, because we're we're getting we're getting like a lot of a lot of interesting things that I can't really talk about yet too much, but we're there might be some interesting opportunities coming up for um for challenges going forward. So uh yeah, I'm really interested in the next one. I promise the next group of people are gonna do some insane stuff. Yeah man, I think so too. Yeah, really great idea, Lloyd. Exactly. The hours people put in was insane. Yeah, that's that's the thing. We we're gonna we're gonna look at all the feedback that that both teams gave, right? We're gonna see and deliberate and and see if we can um if we need to do some tweaks. If we're gonna do some tweaks, I mean, we we still need to get together. Um, there's also some people that offered up their help to to help out in the next challenge so yeah i think i think the next one is going to be really interesting yeah thanks so much everyone that that made made these challenges the outcomes are like really really great if you hear i haven't filled out the feedback do it yeah this is awesome. All right, cool. Then uh, 
we don't have anything more in the chat so this was a uh, this was like a good lengthy ama we went through some feedback showed off like a couple a couple of things inside of the engine which is actually a pretty good format for explaining stuff in a more direct way right where there's actually some examples on the screen too so if there are more practical examples for like the next amas like feel free to just drop them in in the discord channel and then um i'll think about how i can present it or how how i can uh can help you guys out thanks y'all for doing this yeah thank you for taking part Ioana. like it was it's fucking awesome and uh i mean it's also fun to see to see like people get together and like work together in this way hydrate <laughs> like a really good point waster here <laughs> All right, everyone. I thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for all the support. And uh, you can find all the links to to like the community and Beyond Extend and all that stuff down in the in the channel. So uh, have a go, check it out, and I'll hope to see you soon. And have a nice Sunday, everyone. See ya.